Aside from Halloween, there is no other holiday quite as popular for horror films than Christmas. With Christmas Evil, Black Christmas, Gremlins, Krampus, Elves, To All a Good Night, The Silent Night, Deadly Night series, and countless others, Christmas horror continues to be as popular now as ever. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's December, and what better time than now to watch a Christmas horror film? For that, I recommend the 2016 Christmas horror film, Better Watch Out. This is another occasion where I highly recommend if you haven't seen the movie, you should watch it first before watching the video. I have to cover some spoilers to talk about the making of this fully, and really, you should see the film without knowing anything. Don't watch the trailer either, it just gives the whole thing away. The less you know going in, the better. Chris Peckover is a writer, producer, actor, and director who went to film school at USC. His love for horror started by accident. One night his parents went out for dinner and left him and his younger brother without a sitter. She rented Child's Play for them to watch, thinking it was a kid's movie. This traumatized him until the seventh grade. When he was 13, he saw the Steven Spielberg classic Poltergeist, which was what inspired him to want to make horror movies when he grew up. Roughly a year after he graduated film school, he sold a script he'd written called Undocumented. It was a found footage style film about a documentary film crew following around a group of illegal immigrants as they're trying to cross the border to the U.S. The group gets caught by a gang of sadistic radicals who tortures them for the remainder of the film. He not only wrote the film, but ended up directing it, and it was released in September of 2010. Peckover was excited because he'd written and directed his first film right out of film school. Unfortunately, it would take him a lot longer for his next film to take shape. He was working on a project called Limbo for Universal that, ironically, was in development limbo. While this was going on, he had a meeting with producers Brian Hamble and Paul Jensen, who presented him with a script called Safe Neighborhood, which was a Christmas-themed horror comedy written by Zach Kahn. Peckover liked the script, but he wasn't completely on board with it. The script had a million-dollar twist, but he felt the rest of it wasn't as strong as it could be. The first half was great, but the second half was borderline torture porn. He thought it had a lot of promise, and presented them with some changes he thought would make the concept better. He pitched them the idea of making the script into what he considered a meta-approach to Home Alone. He wanted to make it more palatable and less brutal, moving the tone more in the direction of a black comedy. One of the things he learned while working on Undocumented was that less was more. By dialing back the gore, it made the moments of violence stand out that much more. Another major influence was a horror movie released around Christmas, but wasn't a Christmas movie. The horror comedy Scream. He was expecting them to decline his changes, but instead, they were intrigued and wanted to see him do a rewrite. He worked with the original writer, Zach Kahn, to do a complete overhaul of the script. Peckover presented the new script to the producers, who all loved it. The new script is about an incredibly smart 12-year-old kid who finds out his longtime babysitter's family is moving away. He has a crush on her, so he intends to manipulate her emotionally as a way to get her to fall in love with him before she leaves. When things don't go as planned, his schemes go down a very dark path. Peckover had a great relationship with producer Lorenzo DeMeo, who introduced him to some Australian financiers. They liked the project and agreed to fund it. While looking at the script, they decided they'd be able to film most of the movie in one location. Since the funding was coming out of Australia, as a way to stretch the budget, they decided to film on the huge 20th Century Fox lot in Sydney, Australia. They built the entire house in the yard on the biggest stage they could get on the lot, although most were already being used for the filming of Hacksaw Ridge. The stage was enormous, with the yard set going back 60 feet. Since the house was going to be the main location for the entire shoot, they made it as sturdy and realistic looking as possible. They built the set with an open floor plan, which allowed them the freedom to do things like having lengthy tracking shots that went through the house. They designed it so the house would be its own character. With the foundation in place, they started casting. Since they'd be filming in Australia, they cast from a pool of local Australian actors and actresses. Casting was tough and took much longer than anticipated. Casting kids who looked 12 and could handle what they wanted was proving to be very difficult. They saw over 200 auditions before finding their lead character, Luke. Luke was to be played by a then 13-year-old Levi Miller. They said Miller reminded them of a young Leonardo DiCaprio. He had no problem switching between devious and awkward kid. They auditioned another 50 kids before finding the right actor for Luke's best friend, Garrett, who was to be played by 14-year-old Ed Oxenbold. For the babysitter friend, Ashley, the director wanted actress Olivia de Jong. She had just done three horror films in a row, The Sisterhood in the Night, The Visit, and Scare Campaign, so she wasn't looking to do another. Coincidentally, in The Visit, 
She co-starred with Ed Oxenbold, who played her younger brother. The director had a Skype conversation with her to tell her the character wasn't going to be a begging victim, but rather she was going to be tough and resourceful, like Ripley from Alien. This immediately sold the actress on the film. Luke's parents were much easier to cast. The first choice for the mother and father was Virginia Madsen and Patrick Warburton. They sent them the script and they both said yes. For the ex-boyfriend Jeremy, they cast Dacre Montgomery. He'd done some shorts before this, but this would be his first film. For Ashley's current boyfriend, they hired Alex Mikic. With the exception of the parents, the cast were all relative newcomers, and each only had a handful of productions they'd worked on up to this point. They were also all from Australia. They started filming on January 8, 2016, on a budget of around $2 million US, or $3 million Australian. While they were filming in January, that summer in Australia. Funny to think they'd be shooting a movie about Christmas in America while filming during the summer in Australia. They shot the majority of the film on the set in Sydney, Australia. The exception was the opening moments. They shot those in Minnesota. The structure of the film was taking place in one location over one evening. Thankfully, due to the size of the house set they built, they had an easier time of keeping the look engaging. The open floor plan allowed them the ability to have plenty of different camera angles to shoot from without getting too claustrophobic. While they were filming in the yard, the director joked about how it was messing with their heads. It was about 85 degrees on the set, but they were surrounded by fake snow and the appearance of Christmas. It somehow felt colder outside the house, even though it wasn't. Garrett was a representation of director Chris Peckover's past. He was afraid his friends would think he was poor, and as a kid, he looked up to his friends who had money. In the movie, Luke relies on this power dynamic as a way to use Garrett for his own needs. It's never explicitly shown in the film, but you get the idea that Garrett's family isn't as well off as Luke's. While working on the film, they ran into a problem. Dacre Montgomery had been cast in the big budget Power Rangers film. They were getting ready to shoot his scenes, but a week later, he'd be leaving to go shoot his much larger film, which could potentially be his big break. His agent stipulated that he could do absolutely no stunts, which was a problem because his character was supposed to die by hanging. There was nothing they could do that would put his potential career in jeopardy. He was just going to be in a harness, but even that was too much, and the agent demanded they change it. They did what they had to do, which was rework the scene. Initially, it was just going to be one long shot of him being hung. Now they broke it into 14 different shots, none of which he was in any sort of danger. As it turned out, the limitation made the scene better. It was now much more effective. So sometimes, limitations do end up benefiting the production. Peckover is a huge fan of John Hughes. He called this the house next door to the McAllister home. The paint can scene was the biggest homage to Home Alone. He wanted to show how much damage these things would actually do to a human skull. They intentionally wanted the film to have a massive tonal shift about the midpoint. Luke and Garrett are playing around, so it seems mean-spirited, but not evil. Then once Ricky takes a can to the face... <gasps> the whole dynamic changes. At that point, the audience sees the severity and seriousness of the situation. Up to now, they've been riding a fine line of tense but funny, which this moment intentionally crosses. Because the scene happens at the midpoint of the film, they had to have the actor sitting in the background, covered in paint for several days. While the influences from Home Alone are a little more obvious, the scream influence is just a bit more subtle. They were averaging about 12 shots a day, which was way too slow for an indie film. They were eating through the budget, and the director was getting worried. They wanted to do the majority of the effects for the film in camera. There was less than 100 CG shots in the entire film. Most were just wire removal, and little things like additional snow. They also added in some CG trees in the backyards to give it more depth. They did have one scene that was planned to have CG, a moment where Ashley has a spider land on her face, and she almost falls down the stairs. The director was worried because they were behind schedule and the budget was running out. He announced they might have to cut the scene because they could no longer afford the CG spiders. The actress stepped up and suggested they use real ones, even though she was terrified of spiders. She told the director she'd soldier through because she believed in the production. So they shot the scene with real spiders, and had to do it five times to get it right. Her screams were 100% real. The movie was exceptionally tough on Dijong, because she had to act through most of the film with just her expressions, since her mouth was duct taped for the majority. This just showed how talented she was, that she could convey her emotions with just her eyes. They ended filming in mid-February after a 30-day shoot. 
About a week and a half after principal photography was finished, Virginia Madsen and Patrick Warburton arrived to film their scenes. They shot for an additional five days. They took the footage and moved into post. After editing, they took the film on the festival circuit. The movie premiered at Fantastic Fest in 2016 as Safe Neighborhood. How the hell don't you have a security system? We never needed one. It's a really safe neighborhood. In a stroke of luck, marketer Josh Olson came to a random screening. He met with Peckover and told him he loved the movie and wanted to be in charge of the marketing. He had just done the marketing for the Evil Dead remake and Don't Breathe. The two went out for an hour to discuss the film. The first thing he wanted to change was the title. How could they have a Christmas-themed horror movie with such a basic title? He said he'd change it to the much more appropriate, Better Watch Out. Peckover agreed this was the right choice. They got a lot of offers for distribution, but the best one came from Wellgo USA, which they took. Wellgo was trying to get a foothold in the U.S. market, and they were picking up some high-quality films like this, Train to Busan, The Wailing, and The Endless. The movie had its biggest theatrical release in the U.K., 200 screens. It hit the art house theaters in the U.S. on only 25 screens. Critics and audiences loved the movie. It scored an 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. It won numerous awards. Best European North South American Feature at the Fantasia Film Festival. Best Actor, Levi Miller. And Best Death at Fright Fest. Best Australian Feature Film. And Best Performance in a Feature Film Male for Levi Miller and Monster Fest. At the Ithaca International Film Festival, it won the Audience and Jury Award for Best Film. The movie was released on Blu-ray on December 5th, 2017, and became another instant classic Christmas horror film. Better Watch Out is one of the best Christmas-themed horror comedies out there. It works as being a mean-spirited version of Home Alone, but also as a bleak coming-of-age tale in the age of too much information. The cast is amazing, with Miller going from spoiled kid to ruthless spoiled kid. Most kid actors don't have that much range. It's hard to pull that kind of performance from someone who hasn't had that much life experience yet. DeYoung's amazing in a role, as the unwitting pawn in Luke's game, who outsmarts his attempts to win her. Oxenbold is also great as the best friend Garrett. You really feel for this kid, who's just trying to support his friend until he realizes he's being used. The movie's about growing pains. It's about this kid who wants to be older, and is there mentally, but not emotionally. Emotionally, he's still a 12-year-old kid. In the age of the internet, Kids today are smarter, but are lacking in social and emotional maturity. It's not a typical teen movie, but it speaks to teens. Peckover wanted to make it about what it's like to be a teenager now, and how kids don't want to be patronized. The first half of the film is the kid trying to impress the adult. The second half is the kid not getting what he wants, so he's throwing a tantrum. A giant, murderous tantrum. He thinks love is a possession because he lacks the emotional maturity to understand what it really is. Miller was talking to the director and had this epiphany about his character. At the beginning of the movie, Luke thought he was going to gain a possession, but really by the end, he lost two. He never thought he'd lose Garrett, his best friend. Garrett was loyal, and Luke thought he would always be able to manipulate him. They made Garrett the moral compass and the mirror for the audience. The movie was also about what Ashley was going through. Because of the events of the evening, she was being forced to grow up fast. So you have the duality of the kid who wants to be an adult, and the adult who just wants to be a kid. Chris Beckover did a terrific job with this. It's a shame it took six years to go from his first film to his second, because he's clearly talented in all the various facets of filmmaking. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next. I just hope it doesn't take as long. As of currently, he's back working on Limbo, which is finally going to start filming in March of 2020. I wish him the best of luck. I'll watch whatever his next movie is. Montgomery did go off to star as the Red Ranger in 2017's big-budget Power Rangers film. Unfortunately, it wasn't as big a hit as the studio hoped, so the film franchise was put on hold. It worked out for the best since he was able to star as Billy Hargrove in Stranger Things. Better Watch Out is a movie that deserves all the praise it gets. It's smart, scary, clever, and downright entertaining. It's interesting, though. The director wanted to make it so the audience felt guilty at the end for being entertained. In a way, I get that. If you really look at the film, it's a vicious story of a spoiled kid who was willing to kill people who genuinely had affection for him just because he wasn't getting what he thought he deserved. The film is the audience laughing at a very taboo subject. It's not really something that should be celebrated, but wow is it ever satisfying.
Robert, that tie. I know, right? No wrong. Please, please, please. 